Welcome to Music Ed Tech Talk, a podcast exploring the topics of music, education, technology, and the intersections between them, with a special focus on the productive and creative process. I'm your host, Robbie Burns. You, you kind of wonder, or at least I do, like, what of this, like, crazy situation that we're in right now as we're recording this, uh with you know all the COVID-19 nonsense like how much of that is going to stick with kids who are really small I don't I don't have kids personally but I have uh uh nephews and a niece and the oldest of them is I think in first grade right now uh and the youngest was just born at the end of February and I wonder like how much of this is going to stick with those small kids when they're my age I think the gravity does not maybe stick. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I'm just shooting an answer out here, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know if, if that is really something that you can comprehend, but certainly like the circumstantial kinds of stuff like, Oh, I remember I made this craft with my parents because we were inside. I don't know. Yeah. They might remember not being able to go outside for or several months or something. Yeah. That'll be interesting to know. Well, I don't know if, if my two month old is, is really making memories yet. But, right. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's funny you think about this stuff. That is like really the silver lining of this situation. I mean, I guess we'll we'll talk about this probably on and off. It's impossible to avoid everything that's going on right now, especially with regards to music technology. Um like you know, I the, the silver lining is one from a professional perspective, I feel like I'm built for this kind of scenario and then from a personal situation, like this is kind of like a child leave 2.0. So it's like, I, I don't know how you're doing with everything, but I'm not, I don't think I'm feeling the, like the, like, I'm not like sinking into a pit of depression. Like I, I think some people are maybe struggling with right now. Yeah. I, I, we were just corresponding a little bit before the call about our experiences with kind of supporting friends and colleagues. And I, I told a, a friend last week that I feel like I kind of cheated, um, because I have, so I teach at the university level undergraduate music theory. Do you, sorry to interrupt you, do you want to like introduce yourself? This seems like the logical place. Yeah, I guess we didn't really do that. Certainly after we heard. My name is David McDonald. Uh, I'm a composer and a professor at Wichita State University. I teach music theory and not at the moment, but usually I teach oral skills as well and music technology um and music composition lessons and uh so yeah we've been shifting all of our stuff online luckily we had some extra time to do that because we are as we record this on spring break and we will start in just a few days online with all of our classes for the remainder of the semester which is six more weeks of classes plus exams all online and who knows what's going on after that um but what I was what I was gonna say earlier is that I so I've been doing all this more or less completely paperless for years now. And so the main thing that I'm not going to have is just in person like lesson lecture time kind of stuff. And if anything, this is an excuse for me to try all of the kinds of content delivery structures that I've been wanting to try and haven't had the space to try for a while. But I certainly see all of my colleagues who have, you know, we have Blackboard, which is a dumpster fire. But, you know, um, as Bonaparte said, we go to war with the LMS that we have. And uh, they've never logged into it at all, ever. And so uh, I've been, you know, kind of coaching colleagues through those kinds of things. And it's a thing that I do pretty much every day, for better or worse, when I'm teaching on campus. And that part of my teaching isn't going to change at all. So, yeah, like you're saying, like, I feel like I'm, like you said, I'm built for this. I, 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 this is all the things that I do well. Yeah, I can agree with that sentiment. I, I think the defining difference is like in the performing arts, they're, they're like, I, you know, my class schedule, I teach a lot of small pull out classes. Like here's clarinet class, here's flute class, but the band experience, the 60 person in a room here's the downbeat concert band like that. That is not going to be what it was. And um, that's like totally devastating for everyone, but it's also what it is. It's a, it's a fact that 
I have accepted. And it's, it's all of the rest of the delivery of instruction that I do feel pretty good about. And it's interesting. You see, like there's a lot of online, particularly on Facebook, there's a lot of online communities centering around turning musical instruction digital right now. And it's, it's, kind of frustrating how like it's like you can you can like just feel the anxiety like as everyone is like what's which voice app is going to let me like do my band rehearsal and it's like sorry it's done yeah like, it's not going to happen yeah it's it's not happening uh and I can, like you, you said know, it's totally heartbreaking right like it's 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 genuinely heartbreaking the day we got the order that or the the faculty at wichita state were informed that we were going to move all of our courses online we were told in the morning and students didn't find out until late in that day. Uh, and we weren't supposed to tell students, but that day was one of the first dress rehearsals for the opera performance. This opera was cast like they had auditions and casting in November and they were prepared to do uh cozy fan tutte last weekend. And, you know, they've been working on it for six months and all of a sudden can't do it. It's, it's that's the kind of thing that heartbreaking. Right. That's the thing that bums me out the most. And like, I'm, I'm going to be fine. Like I said, I have, we also moved recently, like between a new house and a new kid and like plenty of stuff to keep me busy. Like I'm, I'll be fine, but like, I can just not even imagine what it'd be like to be you know, a seventh or an eighth grader. And like, I just don't get to bring my instrument to school and play or see my friends or, and to, take it to another level i mean maybe similar to what you're saying like i have a student teacher this year and we just got word from the university that even if my district which is in the state of maryland returns to school this year because the university that my student teacher is from has shifted online for the semester she is not allowed to step foot at my school no matter what and it's one thing for the instructor for whatever that student teacher is doing in their curriculum it's one thing for the instructor to say yeah you're okay we we know this is like out of your control but there's like a there's a licensure issue there that is out of the hands of a lot of people like we, we've got a big nursing school at uh the school where i teach and like those those people just aren't getting their clinical hours that they need to be licensed nurses which we absolutely clearly need right now um, and so obviously, you know, this is a different sort of licensure, but yeah, I, I, there's not, there's not a great workaround for that. And for, like you said, teaching band, you know, those kids just don't get those experiences, at least not right now. And there's, there's not, there's not another thing. I mean, you can give them other things, but you can't give them that. And it's, it's really, it's really a bummer. Well, the best you can do is just continue to find the silver linings, however cliche that is. Like I, I'm trying to think realistically and, and I'm not. If there is a, a teacher who is feeling that crushing anxiety right now, I would say like of, of the many messages I would want to send to them right now, like the first of which is like that the at least for, for me, maybe and maybe people are getting different messages. But the message from my district is like, calm down, like we're not going to expect any of you, anything of you that you cannot handle. And, you know, I think there's going to definitely come a time where more of the learning is shifted to online and more is expected of us. But from the time being, I don't think anyone is being asked to rethink how they teach their content. I think just that the resources and methods and delivery of instruction, we're going to have to use some tech tools to, to work through that. But like for me, I'm not trying to ask myself, how do I like do band online? I'm more just saying like, how do I do the things I already do with computers and remote learning? And I, I got to say like, there are some... Speaking of silver linings, there's a couple of scenarios that I think actually might improve the instruction. Like I, I can tell you that there are kids in my wind ensemble who don't really play their instrument as much as they should. When I assign a video performance assessment, which will be probably one of the primary ways that I assess, like there are going to be kids who are trying to get that right for the camera numerous times in a row, and it's going to be numerous times in a row more than they had probably taken their trumpet out of their case this school year. Right. I mean, even if they just take it out that one time, they'll probably play it at least three or four times before they do the one that you see. Exactly. So, I mean, you know, I'm trying, I'm trying to search for that stuff. Um, but, but yeah, in, in summary, yes. I mean, being two people who are already kind of, 
you know, looking for, I mean, you see like from, from your work online, you seem like I'm, I'm excited to talk to you because you, you seem like someone who's like on the hunt for tools that are going to make your life better and your, you know, that are going to amplify your professional work environment. Like I, you know, like you don't, for example, like you don't do any of your work with school editors because like it is a natural requirement of your teaching. Like you seem like someone who's actually enthusiastic when, you know, like the iPad gets a new feature that'll make you like save a couple of clicks or taps or something. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I love my iPad. I use it probably more than my, my Mac, at least when I'm teaching, when I'm, when I'm doing my own like personal creative work, when I'm writing, I'm not using my iPad very much at all. That's almost all on my, my Mac. But when I'm teaching, uh, it's, it's all on my iPad and I'm, I try to use, as, as many of the tools as, as, as will help me. Um, and, uh, you know, my friends kind of make fun of me cause I'm always recommending this new app or showing them this new app. And they, they, they joke that I, I just like apps, like as a, as, as a concept. Yeah, I get that too. It's like, I'm the app guy. Like, tell me about all the apps. And I'm like, no, I mean, I just, I really like something goes off in my brain when I do a little bit less work to get to the same result that I got to yesterday. Totally. Yeah, I'm I'm there with you. And the iPad in particular is such a fascinating thing from a teaching perspective. Like I, you know, for me it's it's the same. Like the iPad is the device that I have when I'm on the podium in the band room and in increasingly in more scenarios than just that, but there's something about it that like it's hard to like when you attach the 12.9 inch iPad to the keyboard case, it's really a laptop, but Something about the way that it's shaped when it unfolds, that slight bit lighter that it is, the fact that I can scribble directly on it or fold it flat, like it is infinitely more accessible to me to just lug around the school building, especially teaching out of five or six different classrooms than a MacBook is. I, I have a confession for you, and that is that I have never owned any keyboard cases for any of my iPads because I just don't use the keyboard that much with it. I use the pencil all the time, all day long, and I just don't have a lot of use for a keyboard. I carry uh, an Apple Magic Keyboard 2 in a Studio Neat canopy, which is like a kind of hard-sided wrap thing for the, the keyboard to kind of protect it, and then you can open it up, and it's got a stand for your iPad kind of built into the, the case for the keyboard. It's super lightweight, and I carry that in my backpack, and I get it out and connect it to my iPad maybe once every quarter-ish, like two or three months maybe. It, it's very rare. Um, so I'm mostly using my iPad with the pencil. And in fact, um, you know, you mentioned notation apps, and I do a lot of kind of just poking around the, the space of notation apps for the iPad. But to be honest with you, I don't really use them very much, if at all, in my teaching because a lot of the things that I want my students to do, I want them to write it uh, by hand. And so I want to model writing it by hand uh, when I'm doing it in the classroom. And especially for the, the first year music theory students who are really just getting in the fundamentals, they need to learn certain things about how music notation works and up stems and down stems and what side of the note head they go on. You'd be astonished at even through two or three months into a first semester music theory course, how many students still are putting down stems on the right side of the note head in staff notation. Um, and so just, you know, having the practice and uh, seeing that happen on the screen and in as many different settings as, as we can, um, is really important. And even with my composition students, I ask them to start everything that they do on paper anyway. So there's a lot of reasons why I would rather do something like that on a uh, kind of more open-ended handwriting kind of situation than music. Also for theory, a lot of the things that you write are using elements of music notation, but are not actually a piece of music in the way that an application would expect everything to like have a complete measure and have you know, no, like all the rhythm filled in and, and things like that, that aren't really how we often use those in an analytical setting or in a, a theoretical abstraction. So anyway, um, I don't know how much you want to get into that stuff just yet. 
Yeah, it's, no, it's something I do want to get into, definitely. Um, Because you reminded me of, before we recorded today, you reminded me of a great post you published a little while ago called your, uh, I forget exactly the title, but it was about your iPad paperless workflow. And it, it outlines specifically some of these apps that you're using to take the concept of, you know, a port digital or a analog portfolio and stack a paper and like getting that onto a screen. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is entirely interesting. Like I said, the iPad is the more and more powerful it gets, the more and more attractive it is to me just because of, and, and it's so hard to explain because again, it's really not with the keyboard attached, it's not that different from a MacBook, but it totally is. Just being able to rip off the iPad like you use it and just slap it on a table or hold it in my hands or or instead to, uh, you, you know, this is another thing. Like so the software is has just got a little bit more brevity to it. Like when I turn it on and it does the facial recognition, I'm up and using it without the cruft of the Mac that I sometimes get where it's like, uh, like system, like some dialog boxes pop up on screen and there's a system update that it's reminding me to do. And I have a lot of little like widgety kind of toolbar stuff that loads up. You know what I mean? Like oh, the yeah. simplicity, yeah, all, all of your toolbar things loading slowly, 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 and then bartender loading and shrinking them all down. Right. All yeah. of it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the iPad is just on. And I, and I'd love to believe that if we get arm based Macs anytime in the next year, that, that maybe like what isn't there like a famous Steve Jobs ism about like why doesn't the Mac when I hit the power button turn on just like the iPad like make it make it work like the iPad isn't that a I feel like I read an anecdote about a board meeting I don't know what, what, for, unless we hear otherwise we'll assume that that happened I mean it's just it's just like the iPad I, I, I can just slap it, you know what I mean like I like for some reason there's this barrier it's like I'm not going to put my MacBook on the kitchen counter while I'm cooking but I have no problem answering some email and sketching out some notation with my iPad right next to me while I'm like managing chicken or something. And that's to me, the sketching out thing is the, is the really crucial part there. Like I used my iPad air two for a lot of these things. In fact, the, the post that I, uh, that you mentioned earlier, like my, my workflow with iPad and composition lessons started when I was using an iPad air two. Um, but, the thing that really made it work for a day-to-day -day thing is the Apple Pencil, and now the Apple Pencil 2. Uh, my, uh, so I, I had my first iPad was an iPad Air 2, and then my second iPad was the 12.9-inch iPad Pro, um, the original one, which I want to say is like 2015 or something like that. And Sounds I'm, about right. I'm currently using the 2018, which until a few days ago, as we're recording this, was the, the most recent iPad Pro. And again, it's the 12.9 the inch, which I believe is the one that you just mentioned that, that you have as well. Um, and so when I was in school in as an undergrad and then later a grad student, every week for a composition lesson, which by the way, if you've never had a composition lesson, this may seem like, like a weird concept. It's one of the, the common questions that I get, even from musicians, like what is a composition lesson? It's basically the same as any instrumental lesson. You bring in the thing that you're working on, you show it to the teacher, and you guys talk about what you could do to improve it. And the teacher says, well, maybe you should try this or this or this and come back and do these things. And we'll talk about it again next week. And so as an undergrad, I would, if I had anything written down, sketches on paper, I would bring those in. But then when I started working in the computer, and I have been using Sibelius now for about 20-ish years, um, I would have to print it all off and bring it in. Uh, and so, you know, when you get close to the end of a project, that could be 20, 30, 40 pages, and you might change small things throughout the thing. So you can't just print off the most recent couple of pages from the last time. You have to print off the whole thing every time. So it's super wasteful. And so I'd bring in a stack of papers just to use for that one, one hour lesson every week and then immediately put them in the recycling bin. Um, so now my students have a Dropbox folder that I share with each of my students, and they whatever they're working on, whether it's on paper, they scan it with their phone, or they can bring in the paper too, that's fine. Um, or when they are then working in some notation software, they export a PDF in an audio file, put those in their Dropbox folder, and then I can open those up on my iPad when they come in. And um, so I use PDF Expert for this because of the way that it integrates with Dropbox, which is really nice. Um, 
So it has a really nice way of looking through a file structure and you can choose certain folders in Dropbox to sync both ways from your iPad. It doesn't sync everything in your Dropbox. It just syncs the folders that you want. So I have it sync the folder that includes all of my student uh, projects. And so they'll come in, I'll refresh the, the page in PDF Expert, and then I'll have their score right there that we can look at. And I'll mark it up with the Apple Pencil. Um, I have a loose color system where things that we want to kind of improve upon get one color and things that we think are pretty good and we maybe even want to expand, get a different color. And those kinds of things, I can highlight stuff, I can draw all kinds of sketches all over it. So that's really useful. And then uh, they can immediately have that information synced back to Dropbox. So when they get back home or wherever they work, they can open up that same score and see everything that we wrote. Hopefully it will still all make sense outside of the context of my musings uh, in the room. And then the other thing is to help this out, um, composition lessons even more so than applied lessons can be kind of hand wavy and it can kind of be unclear what the expectations are from week to week. Um, when I was in school, sometimes the instruction would just be like, keep working, like wherever you're at, just keep doing more of it. And that is profoundly unhelpful if you are, especially a, a, a younger student. Um, and so I like to keep a notebook for every one of my students. And I do that in GoodNotes. Um, I, uh, in the blog post that you mentioned, I was using GoodNotes 4. And I held on to GoodNotes 4 for about a year after GoodNotes 5 came out for one particular feature that I will mention in a moment. But in GoodNotes, you can create your own template and then you can uh, have that immediately create a new page that's identical to the previous page. And so I created a template for lessons that had a place for the date and a place for the week number that we were on and a place for me to give them a grade on how they had prepared for that lesson. And then a little block where I gave some instruction about exactly what they were supposed to prepare for the next lesson. So it could be a bunch of different transformations of a motive. It could be um, some counterpoint exercises. It could be, you know, write four different versions of the transition from measure 16 to measure 25. Um, or it could be just write in the score up to about two and a half minutes uh, from where you're at now. So it have two and a half minutes total. And then uh, there's always a, a little block next to that for what I want them to listen to for next week. So if they're struggling with some particular part uh, or if I just want them to listen to an interesting piece of music that I think would uh, improve the project that they're working on or their understanding of music more broadly, I'll describe that and I'll put that in that spot. And then that is another thing that they can look at um, because GoodNotes has this feature and this is the one that I had to wait about a year for to come to GoodNotes 5 is auto backup to PDF. You can tell GoodNotes, it normally just syncs over iCloud and it uses its own iCloud storage. It doesn't put the files in iCloud Drive anymore. And uh, it uses its own format, a .goodnotes file. And it's like a PDF file, but with some other things added, but you can have it do this auto backup, which is one way, it doesn't sync back and forth, to PDF to any cloud storage or any common cloud storage. And I use Dropbox for this again. And so I have it, anytime I edit a GoodNotes notebook, it saves a PDF version of that whole notebook to Dropbox. And so then on a Mac somewhere, either my Mac at home or my Mac at school, I have a Hazel rule um, and if you're not familiar with Hazel, it's uh, an application that runs in the background and just does stuff on files. It looks for certain things to change about files, and then it does stuff to those files. And so you can make a rule that says anytime this kind of file changes or anytime there's a new file in this folder, do this thing to it. And so I have a Hazel rule that looks at my GoodNotes backup folder for my lesson notebooks. And I say, anytime this student's lesson notebook gets updated, make a copy of that PDF in their shared Dropbox folder. And so every one of my students has this Dropbox folder that has all of their submissions for the whole uh, semester of every version of the score that they've submitted, every audio file that they've submitted, and then also this notebook that has recorded from week to week to week exactly what topics we've talked about, 
some suggestions. So the, the notebook has staff blanks, Dave's in it. And so I can write kind of suggestions for things in there or sketches for things in there that I want them to think about exactly what they are supposed to do from week to week to week and what their grade was on that lesson. I give them a score from zero to five for every lesson that they uh, have. And then they can kind of keep track of it there. So everything about their lessons is in this one Dropbox folder. And the only thing that's not in the Dropbox folder is our verbal conversations that we have in the lesson. Um, and so that's not going to change at all as we move online. The verbal conversation is just going to happen over a video conference online. And we use Zoom for that. And so uh, Zoom has this great feature where you can airplay to Zoom. So I can um, actually just show my iPad screen to my students along with my face side by side, because um, who wouldn't want to just see my face all the time um, in our composition lessons. So that's actually not going to change a whole lot about my composition lessons, which is kind of delightful and kind of, um, like I was saying earlier, kind of why I feel like I'm cheating. So anyway, I've been talking for so sick and long. You, you're, you're probably sick of hearing from me. Do you have any questions no, about it's, that workflow? Yeah, I have like, it's brilliant. I love it. I have like eight questions because I, I wouldn't use- Hit me. All, all of the stuff that you just mentioned, all the apps are all very much a part of my own paperless workflow. Um, I would not use any of the features in the same way that you just described using them, obviously, because I do not- have the same kind of job, but I would totally use a lot of these features. So let me go, I got to figure out what order I want to ask these things because I was writing them down. So sure. the air, I'll, maybe, maybe I'll start backwards. So the AirPlay to Zoom thing, that's native AirPlay. Is, um, like you're using like the Apple, is it like sort of a Zoom feature that so allows Zoom, you that sort of... Yeah, so in Zoom, you can click a button to share your screen and it says share screen, but actually a whole bunch of options pop up when you click it. And one of them is AirPlay. And if you select AirPlay, this is on your Mac, by the way, or Windows. Okay, so you, obviously you can't do this on iOS because there's no way to share a screen, at least that I know. There of is a way iOS. to share a screen. And I think you can do this on iOS directly as well. Um, I have not tried it though, but I'm pretty sure you Wait, can well, share tell a screen me, on Tell iOS. me that before you move on. Uh, is that, which, which application is that using? Uh, in Zoom. Oh, in Zoom. So, really? So, Zoom? Yeah, I, think, iOS. I think iOS 12 or 13 may have added a screen sharing API. Uh, it was the same time that they added the uh, screen capture video feature. They added an API that developers can share an iPad screen. I'm pretty sure. I haven't tried it. All right. I'm going to, this is, I'm going to play around with this later tonight and try to find that because that for obvious reasons would be very useful. Yeah. Um, so, but you're, for, but you're on the Mac, even though you're doing this on the Mac, are you airplaying the iPad screen through exactly. the Mac zoom conference call? Okay. Exactly. So on the Mac, uh, in zoom, when you click screen share, a whole bunch of options show up. And this is true. If you're using windows as well, you'll get basically the same options. One of them is airplay from iPad or iPhone. And so if you are on, especially a home network and not a, uh, a hostile networking environment like most of our schools, um, you can just AirPlay from your iPad to your desktop computer. Uh, and that will show up basically exactly the same way it would is if you were iPlaying or iPlaying, AirPlaying to something like an Apple TV in a classroom. Uh, it, it works exactly the same way as AirPlay does. Um, and so when you do that, you just, you turn that on, on your, on your desktop computer and then on your iPad, just like airplane to anything else, you open up control center and tap screen mirroring or the airplay, if you just want to use audio and that will show up as an airplay target. So essentially zoom. And we, by the way, I'll say the first time you do this, zoom needs to download a, an airplay plugin. And it happens kind of instantly in the background. You don't need to do anything special. Just the first time you click it, it says, we need to download this thing real quick. And it takes like 10 seconds and you've got it. Um, but then you just airplay it from your iPad and it's, it works brilliantly. I've even used this just for making videos, by the way. I do this for like, if I want to make a 10 minute video where I talk through like, I don't know, this is the thing I started doing last semester in my theory classes. I only get to meet with my theory students for 50 minute sessions twice a week. When I taught theory at another institution, that's like half what I used to get. 
And so in order to save some classroom time, I will sometimes, if I have a lot to say about a homework assignment that I'm handing back, instead of going over it in class, I'll make a quick 10 or 15 minute video of my general feedback on the homework assignment. So like things that I saw a lot of people do, you know, here's this point of confusion that I see. Instead of taking 10 or 15 minutes of my precious 50 minutes of class time to do that, I'll just make a quick video and post that. And so this is a way to do that um, where I can airplay it to my Mac and I can show my face and gesticulate as I do, as I'm doing now, even though we can't see each other. Um, and also show the screen and circle things and make markups and scores. Very, very useful piece of, of technology. Yeah, that's great. I don't see myself doing live or even pre-recorded lessons once my district... Le my district is, by the way, we're not... Just so you know, we're not expected to do any work. I expect that we're getting an email today outlining the plan. We're returning, technically speaking, to work next week on Monday. Um, but I... It seems like the county is really scrambling to get the plan together and that we will most likely have minimal requirements for at least the first few weeks, like maybe an hour. I don't know. I'm just I'm just imagining that maybe we'll be expected to give like an hour and a half or so a week of work to students. But anyway, this is a long way of saying like my projection does not include me trying to like conference with students, but I would most definitely love to be able to make a video that involves some amount of iPad screen sharing. And, yeah. and the only other way I know how to do that is with ScreenFlow, but I haven't done the, the iOS screen recording with ScreenFlow in a long time. I have not either. I'll say another thing that I really like about doing this with AirPlay, and I don't remember if ScreenFlow works the same way, but because of uh, the way AirPlay works in Zoom, my iPad just sees it as another AirPlay target, and so any app that is aware of the external display APIs, which is a fun rabbit hole of iOS technology to, to dive down, um, it will not actually show my entire screen, which is incredibly useful. So um, I can, when I'm airplaying from GoodNotes, and there are several applications that do basically the same thing. In fact, uh, PDF Expert that I also mentioned does the same thing, where you can choose what gets sent to the external display. So you can either say, mirror my whole screen, just like it's an iPad, but bigger. You can say, show the whole page of whatever I'm looking at, whatever page of whatever document I'm looking at, always just show the whole page and don't worry about anything else. If I zoom in, don't actually zoom in, continue showing the whole page, which could be useful if you need to write something really like small and delicate, um, but you don't wanna like zoom in crazy and kind of you know give your audience vertigo. Um, and then the other option is to zoom just like I'm zooming on the iPad, but still don't show any of the user interface tools, don't show any of the Chrome, and critically for all of these, don't show any side-by-side -side slide over apps or anything like that. So you can have, say, some lecture notes in another app in Split View, and as long as you've got good notes on the left and your lecture notes on the right, if you do AirPlay from GoodNotes, it'll only show your GoodNotes document. So I do this actually in the classroom as well, is I bring an Apple TV with me to teach my theory and oral skills classes. And uh, I plug that into the projector and the audio system. And then I AirPlay from my iPad and I have GoodNotes on the left, which I treat as a whiteboard. And then on the right in Ulysses, I have my lecture outline. So any things that I want to talk about is on the left, and that doesn't show up on the screen to students. That's just for me. But everything that's on the, uh, or sorry, the Ulysses is on the right. Anything that's on the left in GoodNotes, my students can see. So that's a if really iOS, useful thing too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If iOS forgets which app is in the, um, gosh, what's the word? The I'm foreground? Here. The foreground, thank you. Um, does it flip to a view type of, casting where it's showing you both apps in split view or does good notes or whichever app it's is taking advantage on of this the API. Left. So this is a weird thing of, of iOS, at least to this point is that the app that is on the left is always considered the main app. And the app that is on the right is always kind of secondary. 
So if you have two apps that are this kind of external display aware, only the app that's on the left is the one that gets to control the external display. Now you can decide, so if I've got things in split view and in the good notes settings, I say, show my whole screen, it will show the whole screen with my lecture notes and everything. But if I tell it only show my good notes display, then it won't ever show anything that's on the right side of a split view. And it won't ever show any app that's in slide over as well. So if you want, you could even have three apps up, which I also do when I'm in the classroom to play audio. So I will often have three apps running at the same time on my iPad. I'll have good notes on the left showing a score or a sketch or something like that. I'll have Ulysses on the right with my outline. And then I will in slide over have Spotify or Goodreader or something like that, that I'm going to use to play audio from. And that will be in slide over on top of everything. That's um, like exactly my concert band wind ensemble configuration. Only it's good notes on the left, usually showing a seating chart. Um, the right side, I do my outline and on the outliner for my rehearsal agenda. Totally. And that's usually on the right. And then tonal energy, uh, or actually sometimes four score is on the right side of the screen and then either tonal energy or the outline and on the outliner is a little slide over thing. Um, but yeah, you're, I, I don't really always fully understand how I'm making the good notes thing work. I just know that I am. Uh, <laughs> so, it's, so once I get it into that left position, I was not aware that you had the level of refined controls that you do. I do know that I have that overtake the screen thing checked and that it does show all my students see is the seating chart. Um, and then I can have all my other stuff going on. I do the seating chart because uh, it's sort of a, like a behavior management tool. Like they get feedback, like nonverbal feedback from me about what they're doing, like posture check-ins. Oh, and very All clever. sorts of things. Things that like, I'm not sure every administrator would love that's be like, but I have a real special concert band this year and they need all the, clear like it's, I mean, it's the kind of thing where it's like, you can't be talking right now. It's like, well, I wasn't talking. I'm like, okay, <laughs> so I'm going to use a red letter T is going to on your name is going to mean that you were doing an action that I consider to be talking. <laughs> Let's go from there. Um, and, and it's funny. You, I, I, it started by accident because it was by, by mistake on the screen at one point where I started doing, cause I have like a, like a green pen and a red pen. Of course it's all digital now. So it's like the, it's a color on good notes, but like the, you know, the green dot or symbol on your name means that you're modeling something superior and a red dot means you need some kind of improvement. And, uh, <laughs> I remember the first time I accidentally started doing some, some red markings on the seating chart and everyone got really silent. I'm like, why are we so quiet right now? I realized, Oh, good notes is on the screen. Uh, maybe I should try this again tomorrow. And they like, they beg me for it. Like if, if they're, we're having a bad rehearsal and we're just not getting things done, they're like, can you just put up the seating chart on the screen so that we understand what you expect of us. And I'm like, all right, I didn't know that being decent required that, but I'm here for you. <laughs> so yeah, totally. I can, I can totally see that. Um, my students, sometimes I forget when I'm airplaying stuff and I will start making notes in a score that are not necessarily relevant to what we're talking about in class. Um, but yeah. Uh, by the way, if anybody is, is using GoodNotes and you want to do this, if you click the t or tap the share icon in the top left of GoodNotes, at the bottom, there's three options for presentation mode. And you can choose which of these three modes, either mirror the whole screen, mirror the page that you're on, or mirror the whole uh, page that you're on. So Yeah, I didn't actually even know that that was accessible from the share sheet so that's super helpful yeah it doesn't make sense that it's on the share sheet necessarily because it seems like you would be exporting a file but that's that's where those things live it's very strange but yeah i would be yeah yeah i like it a lot um and so uh, it's it's really changed the, here, another thing that i do by the way while we're talking about how i use this in the classroom is a lot of times especially in aural skills when i'm doing a dictation i can have the dictation on the left and one of the reasons i use ulysses i used to use um uh, just text files and I would pull those up in like uh, a text editor is that I couldn't have images or anything in there. And so now I'll have images of like melodic dictations or something in my outline and those are in Ulysses. Uh, so I can uh, pull those up in Ulysses and play them from there and I can kind of sketch out individual kind of 
um, waypoints in the dictation as we hear them, or we can talk about them. Hey, what, what note do you hear it end on? And then I can fill in the ending note. What note do you hear is the highest note? And we can fill that one in. And at the end, instead of having a student, when I was in school, we would come up on the, the blackboard and, and write it uh, on the blackboard if we thought we had the answer. And now I can just go over to a student's desk and snap a picture of it with the camera on the iPad and drop that into the into the whiteboard document in GoodNotes and show that on the screen to everybody. And then the other really cool thing is that I also use that um, that auto backup to PDFs in Dropbox feature in the theory class. So I never erase anything on the whiteboard for theory class. I just make new pages. And so every time you drag to the next page in, in GoodNotes, it adds a new blank page at the end. And so from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, everything that I've ever written on the board is saved in this one notebook. And so I put a link to that notebook in the Blackboard page for the theory course. And then students can always, anytime they want, come back and refer to it. And it's not always going to make a ton of sense outside the context of my talking over it or, you know, pointing at things while, while we're in class. But it's, I think, a really good starting point for students who are like reviewing for a test or something like that or working on the homework and want to refer to a specific example that is similar to to what we've done in class. And so there's, there's a lot of really cool features to, to having the blackboard be, or the whiteboard rather, be a digital thing as opposed to this this physical thing. I still see students sometimes get out their phones and snap pictures of things that I put on the, the board. And they say that they come back and refer to them later. I don't know if I believe them, but they do. Um, and uh, But e either way, if a student sends me an email, I can then like just grab a copy of that one page from the, the, the class whiteboard notebook and throw it in there and see. It's just like this thing that we did in class on Tuesday. Yeah, that's great. I also use a similar thing, um, another behavioral management tool a lot of performing arts directors will like to do at the secondary level is a silent rehearsal. And um, mm, yeah, they, they are so into me taking a blank, a, a blank screen in GoodNotes and just writing what I want them to do. And then I pull in those seating charts for feedback and I pull in the four score on the other side of the screen and I like just kind of circle stuff in the music and then I point to a section and have them play it like it's great and we you know I, again you're you're totally right you can just save a rehearsal and I, they're not always really that useful to me but it's nice to kind of go back and see like how did I communicate to them without words sometimes it's just abstract shapes and colors <laughs> but right it gets the it gets the message across. So that's I, I still have like eight qu follow up questions because this oh, is sorry. such a great I've been, workflow. I've been blathering on. I've, sorry. No, go it's ahead. it's great. No, the more the more you go, I, I'm just wondering the more follow up I have because this is all such good <laughs> stuff. So I just want to have a side note, and then I'll come back to good notes and PDF expert. Um, for those who are wondering what Ulysses is, it's a really fantastic plain text writing app. Yes. Um, I I use it for my drafting blog posts and for drafting. Actually, I'm making the show notes for this show in it, but it, I also use it as a really simple way to draft sub plans and pretty much any kind of document that's not going to require much more than some basic text with some headings and some bold. I like to draft it in this environment because it's really fuss free, no clicky formatting buttons, but then you have a share sheet that will beautifully format it into a number of different template styles where you can send it as a PDF or as a Word document. And uh, I've recently been kind of swapping between this and, uh, is it AIA or AI Writer? What's? IA Writer. IA Writer, which is so that very That one doesn't good. let you have images, right? So that's the thing is that I like that it stores the files in the file system so you can right. kind of put them wherever you want. But uh, yeah, I've recently found, because I was drafting my blog posts in one of these text editors, and then I was saving it into GoodNotes where I could hand, I like to, I catch more mistakes by hand, like if I'm doing it by hand, like reading it, and then just like underlining stuff with a digital red pen rather than just pouring over it with a keyboard and a mouse. So uh, I would do this, but then yeah, I, I wanted to, um, I just, I use enough images that it was getting frustrating that I would have to like remember, like take screenshots, but then like remember where I intended their, for them to go. So I'm, I'm back using Ulysses again. It just is so frustrating that I, you know, I use Squarespace 
to host my web, actually my school and my personal website. And there's no API for taking, um, for using a third party app to publish to your blog. So like I do all this fine work in Ulysses, for example, with the images all in line. And then I have to like basically export it as rich text into my blog and then re-add all of the images that I've already captioned and everything. It's kind of frustrating. But yeah. Um, the the at least what I have found is lately instead of good notes as the handwritten editing tool, I'm actually exporting from Ulysses to Microsoft Word and then putting it in pages. And Pages has this great annotation feature where with the Apple Pencil, your underlines and circles and markups cling to the words they're associated with. So, and they even like, if you underline a sentence and you write a little note above it, and then you later fix it or even just delete, for example, a sentence, all the annotations just magically delete right with the text because they're linked. So I'm, I'm just finding that as a super useful, I'm, I'm sure it's probably very useful for teachers who are grading papers also. So I mentioned it there because it's, it's like for the first time I've really given that feature an honest shot and it's, very lovely. Yeah, so I don't I don't uh, write probably nearly as many blog posts as you do, but I similarly do most of my writing in IA Writer, and I really like having a big flat folder of markdown files, and I just put in a little placeholder for myself where all the images are going to go, and then I put them all together later in whatever the publishing platform is. And that's particularly useful for me when I'm writing for scoring notes or something like that, where I'm not the, the publisher of that publication. That's that's Philip Rothman's project. I just contribute to it. So I, I, I can't like get API keys for his WordPress installation and I can't like, you know, I, I, I can't install plugins or anything like that. So I just, you know, export my Markdown stuff to HTML from uh, using Marked on my on my Mac, um, which is a, a wonderful utility if you're uh, nerd enough to want to write everything in Markdown like me, um, and just post uh, HTML into uh, the WordPress page, and then I'll bring in my images, which I create separately, and put them in place of all of the little placeholders that I've left in my in my blog post. Yeah, I dig it. Marked is a, is a super app. I love it. All right, I have I have like more I have more PDF expert questions. So, like you I want to come back to like now 20 minutes ago and just say it's <laughs> I love this like just like my students. Like what's that thing that you said like a half an hour ago and then kept talking for 30 more minutes? <laughs> oh no, but it's great because I I'm not going to ignore an offhanded mention of Ulysses without giving it my wholehearted stamp of approval on my podcast. Excellent. Like it's <laughs> Yeah. It's a, it's a great tool. Um and if you're a teacher and you're like wondering like what is Markdown and what is why is this useful? I did a guest post for Katie Wardrobe's Midnight Music where I talked about 10 lesson planning tools that I'm using and there's I think I did an okay job there of explaining very 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 briefly what Markdown is and why it's useful. And I am I am deeply in love with Markdown and uh there's another really useful thing that I do with Markdown and Marked where uh Marked in particular honors this uh, feature of a flavor of Markdown called multi Markdown that it calls file transclusion. And Marked has its own syntax for this too, but you can like basically insert the contents of one file into another file. So uh, I use this in particular for things like syllabi. So if you've ever taught a university course in particular and you have to prepare a syllabus, Oftentimes, especially this has really grown out of control in the last five to six years. Uh, at most institutions, there are pages and pages of, of required policy stuff that you have to put in your syllabus. And you have to do that because it's important, but it kind of obscures the critical parts of your course sometimes, which is a little bit annoying, but you have to do it. And almost every semester, they get updated. And so I have sections for all of these required policies and I put each policy in its own file. So like, for example, the College of Fine Arts has a laptop policy. And so I have the laptop policy in its own file. And then in every one of my syllabi, I have a little line that brings in that laptop policy from a different file. And then inevitably next semester, when that laptop policy gets updated, 
maybe because we're still online or maybe because something changed about how laptops work or whatever, I can update that one laptop policy file and then it instantly will kind of populate out to all of my syllabi that refer to that uh, laptop policy file. Yeah, that's super smart. That's the kind of thing that I would do and then forget that I lacked the f- or had had the foresight to do it. <laughs> <laughs> then I would and then I would redo it later the hard way. That's very very cool. I actually did not know that that was a multi markdown feature. Multi markdown is uh, it's just a flavor like, of do, markdown. I do tables. That's about it for me and multi mark. Are footnotes also Footno- technically footnotes considered? are also multi markdown. So if you yeah, use I footnotes, f- yeah. Footnotes and tables. That's that's the extent of my multi markdown. That's so cool. So I want to talk about like you're you're kind of like hacking the Dropbox backup as a feature for sharing work, which I think is interesting. Right. Um, gosh, I do wish that iCloud Drive had the same APIs as Dropbox because I'm like getting closer and closer to ditching Dropbox every day. But then I'll need to do something like that kind of workflow. And it's like, how are you ever gonna make that work with iCloud Drive? I, I actually think it's frustrating. Like Good Notes. Do, like I wish that you could do the backup to iCloud Drive and have it actually expose the files to the file system because um, if you are using GoodNotes on the Mac, which you now can do, um, they have ported their iPad version over to the Mac, but it doesn't like everything is siloed in the GoodNotes app. Like there's no exposure to those PDFs. Now, if you drag them outside of the GoodNotes interface into the Finder, it works exactly like you would expect. Your PDF goes to whatever folder you want it to go to. But um, it would be cool if I could, without any effort or duplicating the file, if I could just search the spotlight spotlight for something that's in my GoodNotes library on the Mac. Now, I think prior to GoodNotes 5, it did store all of your notebooks in iCloud Drive as dot goodnotes files i could be wrong about that though i don't remember because i i actually did a lot of dropbox cleaning re- and google drive cleaning recently in anticipation of the new icloud shared folder feature which just dropped earlier this week and um i found an old dropbox folder of a bunch of really really old goodnotes seeding charts so i think i must have been using the dropbox version of that when i was on goodnotes 4 Yes, and they have changed the way they use the Dropbox API as well. And in in part of that may be because the Dropbox has changed how some of the API things work. But uh, yeah, they have now a sandboxed app folder for all of their stuff. You used to be able to put your uh, GoodNotes backups in any part of your Dropbox folder. And now you can only put them in the kind of app sandbox area of Dropbox, which is probably safer... Um, but a little bit more annoying if you're used to be able, being able to put them anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I guess I can't quite let go of Dropbox just yet. I, I, I actually really like Dropbox for a lot of things that I don't know if iCloud is ever going to do. I really like Dropbox file requests. I like Dropbox's commenting on files. That's really nice. Um, and for media files, I think you can comment at like a particular timestamp in a video or audio file, which is really handy. Yeah, well, the fact that you can now even like put Google Drive documents in your Dropbox is pretty cool. Like, there's a part of me, like my whole music team, is in Google Drive because that's the d- district blessed file drive service. But, right. Um, and and we, you know, there's always going to be like one person on your music team who's like not gonna like go to extreme lengths like most of our music team is pretty nerdy and like we're gonna download dropbox and google drive and we're gonna experiment with things but you know it's like always easier if someone on your team is just using the district given macbook air and you know using google drive in the web to keep stuff in there so we've got some stuff in a shared google drive but then we've got like i just recently took our we have all of our concert band and symphonic orchestra music you know, in a file system. And so I just recently moved that from Google Drive to iCloud Drive when we're kind of seeing, can this work? Uh, spoiler alert, iCloud <laughs> file sharing is, re- folder sharing is really, really bad right now, at least in my limited experience. Like it's super slow and unreliable. Um, I don't know. The whole the whole thing makes me think like I should just go back to paying Dropbox and move most of my workflow to there, especially now that Dropbox works pretty well on iPad, but this is the thing that kills me is that third party cloud providers on the iPad don't get spotlight indexed. And this drives me insane, like to be able to globally search for a file. Like I want to be able to 
from the podium, like a student says, like, oh, I'm missing the second trumpet part to this piece. And I just like write from the podium spotlight search and, you know, go straight to it and then send it to the printer and say, hey, and go back to my office in a minute. It'll come right out of the printer like that doesn't take any time at all. But with if it's in Dropbox or Google Drive, I have to like tap around to which folder it's in. And then the Google Drive support is really terrible. Like the folders don't even accurately represent how many files are in them. And if you even drag your music library to the sidebar under favorites, like it won't be there the next day. Like it's just a hot mess. Have you, I wonder, I haven't tried it, but I wonder if something like the, uh, the search in PDF expert would do what you needed to do. You mean, so you mean linking P, rather than, cause okay. So PDF, this is one of my questions. So PDF expert can look at the file system, which and this is for, for iPad users who are not really like up on this stuff like we are. Like recently, the iPad has a files app. I assume many people have seen that pop up on their home screen. But now what third-party apps are slowly starting to do is when you go to open or save a file, you're seeing the same user interface that you would see if you were in the files app. So for example, like if you were on a Mac and you said, I want to open or save a file, you would expect to see a little window pop up that looks exactly like the Finder and exposes the same exact stuff to you. So third-party apps are starting to do this. PDF Expert is great because its most recent update makes that interface just one tap away, which I like because I'm storing a lot of my stuff in iCloud Drive, and then it's, you know, it looks exactly the way that I've organized it from the, fi from the Files app. But what you're doing, it sounds like, is you're actually logging into your Dropbox account within PDF Expert. So, like, you could go to that files app open and save window and just go to your Dropbox. But what you've done instead is you've actually logged in separately. You're basically using the PDF expert interface for Dropbox. Yes. And that's what I do for my composition students. And we haven't talked about it yet, but that's also how I grade all of my written theory assignments for my theory class. Yeah. That, that makes so much so sense. So what you're suggesting, yeah, go ahead. So, well, so what you can do is in, PDF expert, there is a section, it, it, like when you open PDF expert, it looks basically like the files app. There's a left-hand rail that has some higher level menu items. And the main screen is just a list of files and folders of whatever folder you're looking at. And you can look at connections. Like you can even look at, um, things that are in files, but, uh, you can connect, uh, Dropbox or any other major cloud storage provider. And it basically acts like a Dropbox client from that point. And uh, for any folder, you can mark any folder as one that you want to sync locally to your iPad, which can be really useful if, like me, uh, you find yourself in situations where your connectivity can be a little sketchy. So our Wi-Fi in the Fine Arts Building is really bad. Um, and so I will usually want to sync anything that I'm going to use in class or in a lesson locally where I can. And so I have chosen to sync the, uh, the class, uh, folders for homework and the lesson folders that I use to share with students for whatever they're working on, um, locally to my iPad. And it's supposed to happen automatically. Sometimes you have to nudge it but it will sync all of those files. Um, and once they're there, you can search through all of the local files. Now, I don't think it's indexing all of the files that exist on Dropbox, but it will look through all the files that you have synced locally. And I, I don't know if it's looking for the contents. I'm usually only searching for file names, um, but it is searching through all of those files. Okay, because it's you, I'm gonna go somewhere right now. We're gonna probably lose people because this is super technical and difficult if you're not staring at an actual iPad. But um, so the way that PDF Expert exposes itself to me is like, you're right, it does look like the Files app, but it doesn't look exactly like the Files app unless you actually hit the little icon that looks like a white square with a little blue folder in it. Um, the stuff that so once you do that, then you're in the files thing. So yeah, right. Then you're, the, then you're in the then you're in the files app. Exactly. So so you're so you can tap that to see exactly the files app. Which if you have Dropbox set as a third party cloud provider on your iPad, you can drill into your Dropbox stuff right from within the files app interface. Or you can do what you've done, which is you've directly linked your Dropbox. Now here's my question: Is 
it makes sense to me. I'm actually trying this with my library right now. I've got my Google Drive version of the band orchestra school library, and I've just selected it as a folder that will live locally on my iPad. Um, it, it probably will. I should have probably done a different one as a demo because it's super big. But what f- this is, and this is something that <laughs> that confused me for a long time with PDF Expert. But there's also two other ways you can get to PDF Expert stuff. You can there's like a PDF Expert folder that lives in your iCloud Drive, yes. which syncs stuff. That's a great way to sync PDFs across multiple Apple devices. But then there's yet a third location on your iPad, which is just like the local PDF expert library, just stuff PDFs that are just living locally on PDF expert that are not syncing over a cloud service. And you can actually access those also in the Apple files app by clicking the three dots right above where it says locations and then clicking the edit button. You can add PDF expert as almost as if like you were using the Mac finder and you were like adding a Dropbox account to your system. Like you can, PDF Expert so, is its own file, pro- is a file provider. So it can show up as another location in files. So that if you had a, like, say you were marking up a score or something like that and, that you had in PDF Expert, and then you wanted to copy it over to Fourscore so that you could have the score in your score reader app, you could make some edits, or maybe you have a, a number of different PDF files that you need to stitch together on your iPad in PDF Expert, or you want to delete some pages, which you can do in Fourscore anyway, so this is maybe a bad example. But once you save it in, in PDF Expert, if it's in PDF Expert's block of storage on your iPad, it's just a, a, another file provider, just like Dropbox is a file provider. And so in the Files app or in the Files provider thing that you can get when you want to add a a file to Fourscore, you can just pick the PDF expert option there and then grab any of those files to move over. So if I have selected, let's say, so I've linked Google Drive directly to PDF expert, which means that I can just tap directly on the Google Drive icon and see it through the PDF expert interface. And I select a folder of PDFs to sync locally to my iPad, does that expose it to the PDF expert extension in the files app? Or can I only see that local locally synced folder when I'm in PDF expert? I think now I have not tested this, but I think you can do exactly what you're describing. Um, I am going to try it right now. So if I open a uh, four score and try to add something, um, well, you know what? That is not true. So my synced files are not showing up in uh, the file provider when I go through another app. Interesting. So they so stuff like that then it seems would show up in just in PDF Expert. But what you were suggesting a few minutes ago was maybe because PDF Expert takes advantage of Spotlight Search, maybe it would take whatever synced folders I have selected and allow me to search them globally, which would be a totally fine solution to this problem. So I don't know actually if it's if it's providing a search to Spotlight. I was using PDF Expert's own search. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Um, I'm not sure if it is providing that search information to Spotlight. I can test it though. Yeah, this I don't, is exactly. I don't think it is, but I will say that it is. Oh, you know what? PDF Expert does provide stuff. I had to scroll down quite a bit, but PDF Expert documents are showing up in my Spotlight search. Okay, now just tell me that a locally synced folder is showing up. <laughs> so uh, the file that I'm looking at is in a locally synced folder. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, so this could be a solution to just sucking it up and leaving everything in a Google Drive. Possibly. I have not done it with the probably the the size of the document set that you're talking about. Yeah, I no, I totally understand that that could be a limitation. I mean, I Google Drive in my experience would be the last to implement it, but like Apple's got to let them link into the spotlight. Like it's got to it's got to be something that you can do with an iPad before I mean, I hate to be one of these people who's like, well, the iPad isn't really a professional tool until this, but that that really feels like low-hanging fruit to me, that if I search for a Dropbox document on my iPad, 
I can't really see it unless I actually go to the Dropbox app. That makes me feel like, you know, getting my Mac out of my suitcase. Yeah, the one that drives me nuts is that uh, anything that I want to favorite in the Files app is just, if it's not in iCloud Drive, it's just not going to be there the next time I open the Files app. If I fa- I can favorite whatever folders I want in Dropbox, as soon as I close the Files app and reopen it, they're gone. It's funny you mention that because I have certain folders that will consistently stay there and certain ones that will not. So like my my shared Google Drive folder with my music team will stick, but the music library folder, that's one layer within that folder, will never stay. So, But every folder that you favorite that's in iCloud Drive is going to work every time. Yeah, it just does not make any sense to me. Right. So there's there, there, there's some work to do with file management still. I mean, I'm I'm ecstatic that we have the files app, but uh, there's work to be done. Sure. Um, since you're a PDF expert power user, I read in their PDF expert seven, which is the new version. I read in the feature list that there was pencil kit support, but I can't find it anywhere. Am I making that up? Uh, I am not sure what you mean by pencil kit support. So pencil kit is the API that it's like the thing that shows up when you select markup, where you get the same tools that you would get if you were drawing a sketch in the notes app. Oh, I and was assuming that that meant that they were using uh, Apple's inking engine instead of their so own. It could mean that because I think Pencil Kit is pretty broad. So I, I do think that Pencil Kit means that also. So I, when they say Pencil Kit support, maybe they're just saying that that part of the API is now built into their application. Because like when I use MindNode, which is a mind mapping application, I can when i go to do the screenshot of my document i can select an option that says full screen and then it'll actually fit the whole document into the view and then take out all the app chrome like all the buttons and knobs and whistles and things and i can just annotate it the document freely much right. like you know you would do with a uh, a pdf in the files app or a a pdf in the notes app so i'm looking for you know i i I would love to be able to use the Apple tools in a lot of third-party stuff just for consistency, but... Right. Well, I actually... Um, so I'll say I, I really like uh, the tools that are built into PDF Expert. So when you're, when you're looking at the markup tools in PDF Expert, you have a bunch of tabs across the top when you're looking at a document. And by the way, I'll also add that PDF Expert has exactly the same three AirPlay settings that GoodNotes has. They call them slightly different things, but you can do all those same three options in PDF Expert as well. Um, and, and maybe even one or two more. But So why do you... Sorry, I'm cutting off a, th- a really good thought, I'm sure. But like, why do you use both? I'm just... Because I use both also, and I don't know why. I use both so of these applications. That's a really good question. And uh, the, the, the first reason is that they did not always both do both of these things. The second reason is that I use uh, GoodNotes for things that are either going to just be for me or are only going out. They're not coming in very often. Um, So things that are teaching things, uh, things that are notes for myself, those happen in GoodNotes. For PDF Expert, those are things that are going to be back and forth a lot. So those are things where I want to be able to sync back and forth. So for grading homework, I want to bring those in, I want to mark those up, and I want to take them back out. If I wanted to do that same thing in GoodNotes, I would have to import all of these things as P- as good as GoodNotes notebooks. So it converts them from being PDFs to being GoodNotes notebooks, and then export them back out to being PDFs so that I could hand back my homework assignments, right? So that's like a, a, a kind of a... Uh, it's a subtle but fundamental difference in how I'm using those it files. Is, it, it is, yeah. And for me, like, a lot of it comes down to user interface. Like I, and maybe there's a way to do this in PDF Expert, but I love not needing to click any buttons to start scribbling on a GoodNotes document. Um, and and for me, PDF Expert is for the stuff that I want to stay living in my file system. Now, if exactly. I could take advantage in GoodNotes of having that stuff look to the file system, and if I could still get that instantly able ability that instant ability to just start scribbling on a document without going into an annotation mode i i think i could probably get away with just pdf expert but then again it doesn't like my seating chart is a paper style in good notes like when i two fingers swipe to the left like it just makes a new page of that same thing exactly 
So yeah, I don't know. It's these subtle user interface elements that keep me using two apps. But anyway, I just thought I would ask you that because it's it's a good question. <laughs> no, so there, and that's that is a really good question, as you say. And also, um, you can do things much like you are talking about to add new pages, kind of like that in PDF Expert, but it doesn't work exactly the same way. But I'll say also the the PDF Expert file format, or sorry, the the Good Notes file format is similar to and probably based on PDF, but it's not actually the same as PDF. So it has some data about the document that a uh, PDF expert doesn't. So for example, it's doing a very loose uh, OCR to try to recognize your handwriting. And that text is searchable in GoodNotes. So if you write words in a GoodNotes document, it's not gonna convert them to typed text. But it will try to figure out what you wrote so that if you do a search in GoodNotes, it can help you find it. Um, and it's like, so those are kinds of f like file format things that aren't the same as PDF. And so I, I, those are things that are useful to me to have as a separate thing than a PDF folder. Right on. Um, but So what I was going to say earlier about uh, uh, PDF Expert is that... Um, at the top, you have these different tabs, and you can have a tab of favorites. And my tab of favorites is extensive. So you can save a pen that is like a certain color and a certain size and a certain style that will always be there when you open stuff up. And so that allows me to use a kind of consistent color scheme for like here are errors here are things that you did well here are things that are notation problems or whatever throughout all of my graded homework and i can use those same colors for a pen or for a text box if i want to type a whole bunch of text i'll type it instead of handwrite it and then another thing that i really like about pdf expert is that i can have all of these stickers across the top as well so i use grading stickers because i teach you know 20 year olds but i'm still a child uh, and so I have like these stickers that I got from like iMessage sticker packs of, of I don't know if you're familiar with the Aminal sticker pack in iMessage. It's the best sticker pack and the only sticker pack anyone needs, except for maybe now there's a Baby Yoda one that's pretty good. But that was a, that is a good one. Uh, the, the, the Aminals sticker pack is amazing. And I have taken a few of those stickers um, and imported them into PDF Expert to use to grade my students' assignments. Um, and so I have those across the top, and then I have a few other like less happy stickers for common errors that they make. So like, you know, about like doubled leading tones or whatever. I have a sticker for that, and I have a sticker for, you know, resolving <laughs> flat scale degree two in the Neapolitan sixth chord and like all those uh. kinds of stupid music theory fundamentals things that everybody hates. Uh, sorry to traumatize everyone. Should have given a trigger warning for you know, lowering the seventh scale degree or whatever. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so I have all of those in a favorites tab that I can grab anytime I need to in a composition lesson or in a, uh, you know, part writing grading marathon. So those are all really nice things that I really like that are, uh, I, I like those kinds of tools better in PDF expert than in GoodNotes. So is there a way to click a setting where... I don't have to trigger an annotation mode. I can just tap the pencil on the screen and get some black ink. In PDF Expert, no. And if you if you are one of the things that I do get annoyed by in PDF Expert is I will ha often have dozens of tabs open for different documents. So when I'm grading one assignment for my theory class that has you know twenty some odd students in it, I will put all of those files in one folder. I'll open the first one and I'll grade it. And then I'll leave that one open when I open the next one to grade it. Because sometimes I'll spot something in like the fifth file that reminds me of something that I should have marked in an earlier file. And I can just go back and grab it because it's still open in a tab. Here's the thing that's dumb about PDF Expert. When you switch tabs, it turns off the tool. So whatever tool you were in, when you switch tabs, you have no tool selected. Um, so you always have to go back as you were saying, and tap the the tool that you want to do. And if you're on, if you're not using any tool and you double tap the Apple Pencil 2, all it does is switch between no tool and the eraser tool. So mm. not super useful there. You still have to go into it. And so that's maybe another reason to really dig good notes, like you were saying before, is that you just open a notebook and start going. 
Yeah, I you end up using GoodNotes more for that reason. The, the best way I can conceptualize them for my own workflow is that GoodNotes is kind of like like digital notebooks, digital journals, and PDF Expert is more like a like a productivity tool for working with PDFs. I don't know. It's the closest I can come, but there's a lot of crossover, and certainly there's a place for both of them in my life. Right. Another reason that I use them both separately um, is that until iOS 13, when uh, apps could support multiple instances of themselves in the multitasking switcher, if I wanted to look at two things side by side, I needed to use two different apps. Yep. And so these were the two that I would often use if I wanted to do something with two different PDF files. I love that both of them have tabs. I, it seems a little odd to me that when Apple allowed their own iWorks apps to support multiple instances of a different window that they didn't also add tabs. Like it, there are times where I would be, I don't what, are, what do you do on the Mac? Are you a tab user or a window user? Uh, for browsers, mostly tabs. What about like pages? Like if you got three pages documents open on screen. At oh, once. I have never used tabs for pages, but oh, I, see, do I love use tabs. tabs. <laughs> I use tabs all the time in Finder. Okay. Yeah, me too. I, but I, it's extended to all things pro apps. Like I've got like my band rosters are all done in pages and I've got them all open in order, all in separate tabs. And then I've got all my seating charts are made in OmniGraffle and those are all open in different tabs. So it's like when I click around my Mac, I've got one instant instance of every application open but then with like kind of a sub menu there's kind of like a hierarchy in my brain of how it's organized but that, yeah that's not an api on the ipad so you can in an app like goodnotes or pdf expert you can have all sorts of tabs open where you can click between them super easily and you know for pages well you can have multiple windows open at once but i don't know we don't we don't need to talk about ipad multitasking now do we <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> I never, I never use it is, is basically the bottom line. Like I never find myself managing multiple pages documents at once on the iPad. Right. Right. Well, you mean multi window stuff, not multi. Yeah. Multi. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is a type of multitasking, yeah. but yeah, multi window is the specific type I'm referring to where it's like, you can have two different documents open and two different windows at the same time. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't use that a ton. Um, well, so this is like turned into, I might as well title this episode Good Notes and PDF Expert because this is like. <laughs> That's all I need, man. Is, yeah. I'm surprised to hear that you don't. So how did you get linked up with Scoring Notes to do the staff pad review? Which, by the way, if anyone's thinking about checking staff pad out, you should definitely read this review. Um, if it's something that is not as much a bread and butter of your professional workflow, like how did that all come together? Yeah, so uh, I think the first piece that I wrote for scoring notes might be the one that you referred to earlier, which is the one about my paperless composition lesson process. Um, and from that point on, I kind of became the unofficial iPad correspondent for scoring notes. And so anytime uh, Philip would get a pitch about an iPad app, he would send me an email and say, Hey, do you want to write about whatever? And you know, as we've said, I like apps. I like music. Let's, let's see what they can do. Um, and the, the thing that I run into with all of these applications is that I am, you know, as much as a, I am a power user, so to speak of PDF expert or good notes. Uh, I am, definitely even more of a power user of music notation stuff like i push a music notation app as far as it will go and i use workarounds and i have done like weird graphical notation things in sibelius and now dorico and i i do i do all that stuff on the mac and there's just not any application that could ever be possible on the ipad that is going to be as powerful as those applications because of the um, business models that Apple allows in the App Store. Those are applications that cost for a normal person, if you were to just go buy a copy of Sibelius or Dorico or Finale, that costs $600. And uh, there's just not a company that is going to willingly give up 30% of a $600 purchase to Apple for one of these applications. And there are so many other limitations with them around 
um, you know, free trials and uh, and, and uh, upgrade pricing and those kinds of things. And so none of the applications that do music notation on the iPad could ever have the number of people working on them for the amount of time that people need to work on something like this for them to be as useful to a composer like me as they would need to be for me to use them in my professional workflow. Now, having said that, I do think that many of them could be useful and practical for a lot of people who are not me. And so those are the kinds of things that I am I am looking at when I write about these applications for scoring notes. And I've got a bunch of them like installed on my iPad. And every once in a while, I think about demonstrating things like this in class. But it seems like to get to the point where I could actually put notes on the page and uh, do something useful with them that I couldn't do just by writing them on the page in good notes and playing them at the piano myself. I feel like that's like a, a just takes too much time to get that set up. Um, I have occasionally just brought my Mac and done stuff in a desktop application, but those are all things when I'm expecting the students to be able to do things in their desktop applications as well. And maybe that's the biggest reason that I don't use these is that my students don't have iPads. Uh, and uh, despite the laptop policy, many of my students don't even have uh, Mac or Windows laptops. So um, if I were to demonstrate something like this, it would only be for classroom demonstration. It wouldn't be anything that I could ask them to like do along with me. But there are some like reasonably good apps for uh, notation on the iPad, but they all have limitations that are always born out of the expectation that uh, the person using them is interested in writing, you know, and I don't mean this as a negative, relatively conventionally notated music with within very specific limitations. Um, and, go yeah, ahead. You're, but you're totally right about where some of this iPad software like strikes a, a balance like for me as a band director and and I do I used Sibelius for a number of years and now I use Dorico on the Mac and Staffpad for iOS is a really really good balance of just the right things that it does and just the right things that it does not do for a middle school band director who is largely like I'm reconstructing missing flute parts from my band library and adding extra percussion parts to you know for my 10 person concert band percussion section like I don't need to do graphic notation or even have the most advanced engraving tools for someone like me staff pad is like finally the iPad app that does exactly what I need it to do yeah, I hear you. And, and and it does a lot of things better than any other option. Um, so StaffPad, if, if if anybody... Have you talked about StaffPad on the show before? Yeah, so I'm, I am... Like, StaffPad is going to get extensive treatment here from um, Paul Shimmons. And, do you know Paul or Chris? I do not. They're, they're, um, they have two blogs. One of them is music... iPad and music technology. The other one is music education and technology i don't know and like i can't there's only so many words you can use if you're in this space um <laughs> forget like what what order their blog titles go in but yeah they're both music education technology writers and um we've been beta testing staff pet i imagine you also were since you had a review out on day one right um so it's like gonna get it's gonna get the full public school educator here's what we think treatment but by all means give the overview now because it's yeah it's worth so mentioning there there have been a lot of applications that have tried something like this where you hand write with a stylus on a screen to make music notation happen um and have that handwritten music notation converted into beautiful engraved uh, uh computer engraved music notation and the staff pad originally came out several years ago on the Microsoft uh, Surface. And I was super bummed about that because I was a very recent iPad and Mac uh, purchaser at the at the time. And uh, it just couldn't work for a number of reasons on the iPad at the time. And so they went all in on Windows and they were like, like super 
uh, uh, prominent in Microsoft marketing stuff. Like they were on stage at Microsoft events. Um, and so uh, there were a number of other apps that came out in the meanwhile. A lot of them used kind of off the shelf handwriting uh, technologies that they kind of just shoehorned into their applications. Um, and then just, uh, I mean, probably a year and a half ago or so, I had a, a Skype call with David Hearn, who is the, the lead project lead on uh, StaffPad, uh, talking about them wanting to bring it to iPad at the time. He said, we're just, you know, a few weeks or a month away or something from a, a beta. And then months and months and months go by and a whole year went by before I heard from him again with the actual beta link. Um, but uh, yeah, so now there's this this app and it's designed really for the way that he writes. He's a composer and he does mostly uh, commercial work on very short notice with um, for, for film or television and, and that kind of thing. And so it's designed to really quickly get something together and put it in front of musicians in a recording session. Um, I don't know if you've used any of the features of StaffPad Reader, but they are really cool. And the way that you can synchronize things and synchronize a click track across uh, everybody reading a score and update things and write notes that show up in the parts and the players can write things that show up in the score. And so there's kind of a, a two-way synchronization that happens there. It's got a really, a really cool set of features for somebody that's working in that very... Um, kind of fast turnaround environment of uh, studio session musicians. And that's where a lot of those tools are, are, are based. And there's a bunch of really cool stuff around the sample libraries for audio playback with this thing that are really, really impressive as well. Um, it, there are other applications that will do this kind of thing. If you don't want to spend $90 without the ability to have a free trial, I totally hear you. Um, but uh, this is, as of the ones that I have tested, uh, and, I, and I've tested a bunch of them, I've written about uh, several of them, uh, StaffPad is by far the best of the options that are available on the iPad right now. Yeah, that's a great summary. I've also used most of them, and this is the first one that well i mean it's it's just so it's just really well designed like i agree with you it does some things better than anything else on the market um I, you know it just it just really gripped me right away because again it it fits from sort of a software angle that kind of hardware angle i was saying earlier where i like just try, i mean like I, I started beta testing it right after my son was born so it's like i'm holding him in one arm i'm like dragging the ipad around the house and like with one hand like scribbling out percussion parts you know it, it just fits that kind of lifestyle and workflow in a way where as as long as i don't need the real pro engraving tools of something like dorico it's gonna fit really well for me in a lot of circumstances and like like a lot um, of apps like that for ipad to me the biggest thing that it has going for it is it's just fun like it's fun to use in a way that the the other big ones that i've used are, are notion and symphony pro um, and I, I've written also a review of comp, uh, uh, but staff pad is just fun. Yeah, no, I totally agree. It does not hurt that they really took the time to design it in an attractive and logical way. Like I have very, very few minor, uh, you know, issues with the way it's designed. Like I, it just is a delight to use. It's very beautiful. Only the, the stuff that and again, I'm speaking from personal experience, but like the only the stuff that is on screen is stuff that I want to see. Like there, like when you go to templates, there isn't a hundred templates. Like I mean, I'm sure there's someone out there who's like composing mariachi band stuff on the daily, but I mean, like I just don't want to see that every time I go to templates. So they've just struck a really good balance. The handwriting is fun to use. I've had some. I'll get into this in the next episode, I'm sure. But like, I've just I've had some issues with it recognizing my handwriting. But yeah, there's I, some overall, real clunkers. Certain syllable, certain symbols. It just just there's no way. Like, I, I don't know if you've had occasion to need to write a double flat. I've not been able to get it to recognize a double flat ever. I I can't even get a forte. Oh yeah, I I have uh, yeah I can't get the a lot of the dynamic stuff are weird too. But thankfully for most of the the symbols there is a backup and that's one of the things that I'm not wild about. I don't want to get into a big staff pad review, but there's not a backup for a lot of the things. That was my main criticism in my review is that when stuff works, it's great. And the problem is that when stuff doesn't work, there's no fallback 
if it doesn't recognize your handwriting. Correct. Yeah. And that's one of the things that really distinguishes this. Like it, it starting on windows makes sense because at the time, you know, there was no official stylus from Apple that could compete. But the thing that almost is kind of frustrating, however excited I am on that it's on iPad now, the thing that Windows has going for it is like, ultimately that thing is running the same operating system that you're running if you're at a desktop Windows machine. Like you can plop that thing on the keyboard and I'm not sure if the Windows version will let you input notes with the keyboard. No, the there's no there's no MIDI support on that too. And it's one of their long running, uh, you know, if you look at forums and things about staff pad, everybody's like, man, I want to use a MIDI controller. And I, that's one of the things that I knocked them for in my review too, is that sometimes it's just faster for me to use a MIDI controller than it is to write by hand. So I guess, so I guess then that my windows argument doesn't really stand if that's the case. But I mean, the fact is though, that it is one operating system for both the, the touch and also for, you know, if you're using it in a desktop mode, I guess that that doesn't really hold up if you're not able to input any notes using the computer keyboard. But I mean, but that I, being I said, will say though, if you are using uh, uh, another one of these apps, you can plug in a MIDI keyboard to Notion or or Symphony Pro, and you can enter notes with a, a MIDI keyboard on iPad even for those apps. Sure, sure. I want to actually touch on something that you said about payment on the App Store because my one of my long-standing dreams is that we will start to see a shift in pro software for the iPad. I think, you know, stuff like staff pad gives me a lot of hope. Uh, the Adobe stuff, like with Photoshop recently released and illustrator coming hopefully later this year. Like it seems like the tide is turning a little bit. Um, but it, it worries me when someone with your industry know-how says that the pricing model in the app store is going to prohibit it from happening <laughs> because to me, it seemed like equal to that is also things like file system support or like cursor support, which we just, you know, like the new cursor support that came out for iPad is really good. And I look at that and I think to myself, like, well, what's, what is there really for like keeping something like Dorico for being on the iPad? If you can attach a cursor and a keyboard to iOS. It's, it's not a technological problem. It's a business model problem. It's an app store policy problem. Um, you know, if, if Dorico costs $600, which I'm pretty sure it does, uh, I think it's pretty hard to argue that Apple is offering $180 of value on that sale. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's fair to ask Steinberg to give up $180 of every purchase of a license of Dorico. Um, having said that, one of the bigger annoyances that Dorico users have is the hardware licensing thing where you have to have a little USB dingus plugged into your computer the entire time you're using it unless you use the software licensor and that's a whole nother thing. But one nice thing about the App Store is that it's pretty hard to pirate software from the App Store. And so that might be a thing that appeals to uh, a company like uh, Steinberg developing something like Dorico. And I will say that Steinberg makes pro apps sort of for the iPad. You can get um, a version of Cubase for uh, iPad and it's extraordinarily powerful. As we're recording this, it is on sale for 30% off. So if that sounds like something you'd like to play around with, check it out. It's normally 50 bucks. It's currently 33 something. Um, but uh, you should check it out, but it's still not the same as Cubase. Um, for a number of reasons. There, there's not a plug-in architecture that's really possible in the same way on iOS um, and all these other, all these other concerns. Um, but the biggest issue, again, is just the, the business model stuff. So, so as, as I'm sure most of your listeners know, you can't have a free trial of an app on the App Store. And there are some weird workarounds for that with you know $0 subscription things. But the problem with doing everything through in-app purchases is that they're not shareable by families. They're not possible to do for institutional purchases for schools. Um, and, and so there are a lot of really annoying things that a company who wants to spend the number of, of hours, of human hours, to put together something like uh, uh, Dorico or Sibelius for iPad the payoff is really not there. I would say of all of the companies that do stuff like this, the one that's best positioned to do this is Avid. 
And that's because they have moved to a subscription-based pricing model, at least as an option. They haven't forced everyone into it yet the way Adobe has. But the reason Adobe can spend all of those uh, human hours working on Photoshop for iPad and Illustrator for iPad is that the people who are going to be using them are paying for their subscriptions outside of the App Store. So you download the app for free, it asks you to sign in with your Adobe credentials, and if you're not an Adobe Creative Cloud subscriber, it's not gonna do very much for you. And Avid could do something like that with Sibelius or with Pro Tools, um, but Steinberg, as of now, doesn't have anything like that. And as far as I know, neither does Make Music for Finale. Uh, so, uh, again, it's, it's not a technological issue. I think a lot of, well, there are some technological issues, but the power of an iPad pro is, as, as you know, astonishing, uh, hardware, uh, and the, the software is getting really powerful as well. And the biggest issue with pro software on these machines is just the, the app store policies. We'll see, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just interesting to see how it shakes out, you know, the Apple store the app store policies are you would you would think that this would be the time we would be starting to see them rethink some of that you know especially with all the other changes that are happening to the iPad Pro software and hardware but it, you know if it hasn't happened in over 10 years i don't know well i i will say that we are talking right now within just a week of apple allowing new apps in the app store to have a single bundle id that includes iphone ipad apple tv and mac so there is at least some softening of some things that we used to think were some of these absolute dogmatic rules of the app store right um where as of uh just a few days ago a developer can put a new app this is of one of the, the points of contention. It must be a new app, but a new app can go into one of the iOS stores or the Mac app store, and a single purchase will get you access to that app on all platforms now. Yeah, that's and that's great. And I'm hoping that that means that more iOS developers are gonna do the catalyst thing where they port their iOS app to the Mac because I'm a little disappointed at how few options there are now. And I've got a couple, particularly two developers who, and they have definitely heard from me, the four score people and the tonal energy people. <laughs> not stopped hearing from me about, because, you know, I plug my Mac in to the sound system at the front of the band room. And I'm like, my goodness, a tuning drone app with keyboard shortcuts and, uh, you know, on my, on my Mac, which is, which is also what I use in my, private studio too so right well know, and like that's my yeah i mean that's that's that that's the dream right is is to to be able to do all those things on on whatever platform you're at i wonder if an app like dorico which has to also use all of these cross-platform frameworks to make dorico run also on windows would make it that much harder to develop all of that logic and do all of that user interface work in catalyst for the ipad because right now they're using the the cute framework which is also what a lot of uh mac and windows cross-platform apps use it's also what sibelius uses um to to develop uh well to have less duplication of efforts when they need to support mac and windows that might make it a little bit harder to also add uh mac catalyst to support mac and ipad as well so they may end up having to do and i think this is maybe why cubase and cubasis are separate is that cubasis is essentially i think built from the ground up from scratch i could be wrong about that yeah that would make sense well and it's certainly easier to go i think in fact i think catalyst only can go from at least now from ios to mac i don't know yeah uh, how you could go the other direction um but the future seems bright. I mean, I and maybe I'm just like being 
I, an idealist here, but I mean, between you have like this whole, um, what's the new thing that was at, announced last last spring? Um, Swift UI. You, you, Swift UI. Thank you. Um, Swift UI, which is this idea that like, hey, one set of code translates user interface to Apple Watch, Apple TV, iOS, and Mac OS. Like, that's kind of a dream. Pe- looked at also the idea that our Macs could be in the future. I mean, I don't know. I, I hear stuff like, you know, people in the in the Mac community like Jason Snell muse about an iPad Pro running Mac OS as a development tool, and I just get really excited. But I, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. The thing that I really want, and I, I talk about this all the time, um, you mentioned Jason Snell. I, I don't know if you're uh, in the Six Colors Slack, but the thing that I always talk about with people in the Six Colors Slack is... Uh, the, the, and the thing that I want more than anything in the world is a 27-inch multi-touch display that can work as an external display for my iPad or an external display for my Mac. And it would be, when it's connected to my iPad, it would be like the giant Surface Studio from, well, I mean, it's, they still exist, but the, these giant imac size screens that will come down and be like an easel and you can have a big, you know, 10-finger touch display and use all of the the wonderful iPad apps that that we've been talking about on this giant display I would love that but then also to when I need something to work and be architected and have the user interface of a of a Mac I can just change the thing that's plugged into it and plug it into a MacBook Pro and have Mac OS on that same big beautiful 27 inch touchscreen basically what I want is an iMac that I can dual boot into iOS is that too much to ask that's all I'm asking I think though Swift UI and the ARM based Mac thing, like I think a lot of shoes are gonna drop in the next couple of years and that like I don't know. I, I think the future is is looking pretty bright. Like I don't think that that's that far off. I, I'm that's from your from your lips to Tim Cook's ears, right? Right. I mean I, I think about that and, and like these some of these computing problems are like I <laughs> like, I don't know what else I could really possibly ask for. Like <laughs> to be able to <laughs> Like I, I just try to think like the, the even the, the iPad. This is why I'm using it for more than just a classroom device these days, is because it checks off more and more boxes every year, and I just I cannot wait. I know as someone who doesn't use a keyboard as much as I do, it's maybe not as exciting. But I mean, like the new Magic keyboard with cursor that was just announced looks like a, a dream come true. So yeah, I mean, I I think know. I will be using it more now. I well, I. So we're talking just a, a day after that was released publicly. I downloaded it, and the first thing I did was connect my Magic Trackpad 2 to my iPad, and it's amazing. It's fantastic. It's everything that I could ever hope for. It is in. It is delightful in all the ways that uh, working on the iPad is delightful, and it is practical in all the ways that I would need it to be to be a useful tool. Uh, I have. I have. Uh, very, very little negative to say about it, having used it admittedly for, you know, total of like 18 hours so far, most of which, you know, I've been using other things too. So, but it's very, yeah, I'm very with cool. You. It's, it is very cool. And the keyboard is going to make it all the better because the main thing that I'm running into is I'm like, well, it's not that delightful having this secondary piece of hardware that's just detached from it that I'm using because I'm also using the Magic Trackpad too. But um you know, when it's just right there in front of your fingers. Well, when your thumb is floating over it, it's going to be a whole different game. Yeah, I, I'm. I've never really been tempted by the uh, the the smart keyboard cover for an iPad, but I am very tempted by the Magic Keyboard for iPad. I don't know if I would carry it around with my iPad, but I can totally imagine using it as like a dock uh, at my desk in my office at school where when I come in, I just kind of magnet my iPad to that dock and leave it plugged in so it charges while I'm there. And then I can type when I need to. And then when I when I want to, you know, sit down with a student and look at their score, I can just rip it off of there, turn the iPad into portrait mode and grab the pencil and go. Um, and, and then, you know, just have that as a, as a place to set it down. I think that is probably the thing that I'm most likely to do if I can convince myself that it is worth $350, which Correct. is, wow, wow. Yeah, I know. It's like a lot Apple, of money. Apple is, has made me spend a lot of money in the last few years, but this takes the cake. It sure does. Yeah. Um, th- 
the sad thing is that like I don't have any question in my mind as if I'm gonna buy it or not. Like it's it's happening. This the second part of the dream is also <laughs> like the the mat the current keyboard case for the iPad Pro makes it even though it's way cleaner and more minimal in terms of like how it opens and closes than the first generation keyboard cover case, it's actually a lot more awkward to take the iPad off of because it does not maintain its form. Like the old origami style keyboard, which I, I gifted to my wife when I upgraded. So she's got it. I mean, you could just like rip the, the iPad right out of it and then slam it right back on without it losing its shape. Whereas, I don't know, I whenever I take my iPad off the second generation keyboard, I feel like it's occupying more space on my desk than maybe it is but yeah i i just have a regular uh smart folio on on my ipad pro and i don't take it out of there as much as i would like uh, i feel like i should take it out there more because i i really only need it for when i'm transporting it but uh i i think this is a thing that would make me if i if i was again and i think i'm probably gonna get it especially if the federal government just you know decides to hand me twelve hundred dollars in the next few weeks uh it becomes much more likely that I'll get one. Uh, but it seems like you can just like kind of rip it off whenever you want and I can carry it around. Like all the videos of it made it look like it was pretty easy to just kind of grab it and, and pull it away from the, the keyboard. And maybe I would just need like a slip cover or something to, to put right, my iPad right. in. And that's what I'm saying is like the joy of using the iPad as an iPad, because admittedly the 12.9 inch iPad really demands to be used more like a laptop than it does a tablet to me, at least in terms of orientation. And to be able to go back to that place where it's a lot easier to just rip it right off the dock, in this case, the keyboard, uh, I feel like that would encourage me to hold it in my hands more and use it detached from the keyboard, which is honestly what I like a lot about using it. And it's uh, it's something that when you use the larger of the two iPads, you know, you don't quite get that comfortable. Like I, I don't read as much in you know bed with my 12.9 ipad as i did my old ipad air back when i used that one yeah i'm i'm the same way when i bought my current ipad pro i sold my previous 12.9 ipad pro but i still have the ipad air 2 and that stays by my bedside and if i ever want to read stuff uh at, at, at night or in the morning i do that on my my ipad air 2 i cannot and i've strongly considered in the past buying a new iPad mini for stuff like that but I would just feel like such a such a chump if I was walking around carrying a MacBook Pro an iPad Pro and an iPad mini all day I could never I could I could never you know live with myself I know I know well and I and I just don't want to learn or have two different iPad OS paradigms in on my person at the same time like I would if I got another iPad I would definitely get the 11 inch iPad pro, but then it's like, I don't, I don't, pe people really think that I like gadgets. I really like don't, I actually <laughs> want to have less of them in my life, not more of them. That's why, you know, the iPad pro is like the closest thing to the one thing I want to be toting around all day. That's yeah, kind of you. why I've landed on it. But yeah, no, I, I definitely wish that it were a little bit smaller than it is for, holding in hands and and to that to that to that point one of the things that i really love about the ipad pro is that it actually allows me most of the time to not have to carry a mac with me when i first started using an ipad i would carry my ipad and my mac everywhere i would carry both to class i would carry both to the office i would carry both to the coffee shop but now unless i am planning to demonstrate something on a desktop application in class, I can comfortably leave my Mac in my office. And when I come from my office to home, I leave my MacBook Pro in the office. I have a giant iMac at home uh, and I will leave the MacBook Pro in the office and I don't carry it with me again, unless I know that I'm needing to do something very specific over the weekend, it stays in my office and that it's great. Yeah, totally. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Hey, um, I've got some lessons starting up pretty soon. Can we do a quick album of the week and uh, app of the week? Yeah, sure. Totally. Um, I don't know what kind of albums and apps people normally recommend. Uh, oh, it's so diverse. That's why I love keeping this as a segment on the show. Okay. Uh, well, so um, I, I don't know what kind of stuff people normally re recommend, so I will recommend something. And if this has been recommended before, let me know. Um, 
and it's it's a, a it's just a single piece of music that I'm going to have my graduate music theory seminar students take a look at pretty soon. Um, but it's a piece of music by Caroline Shaw. It won the Pulitzer Prize in I should have looked this up beforehand. I want to say 2012, maybe 10, eight. Uh, it's called Partita for Eight Voices, and uh, a lot of music that wins the Pulitzer Prize is just like angular and weird and angry and my mother would hate it but it's the kind of stuff that i listen to and i really dig like i list I, i'm a composer i write weird stuff and whatever that's what it is this one piece of music though is one of the most universally likable and liked pieces that has won the pulitzer prize in a very long time it is a piece that i as a, a, a person who listens to a lot of weird ugly music really likes and it is a per is a, a piece of music that people who do not listen to a lot of weird ugly music can really really like it is again it's by caroline shaw um the piece is called partita for eight voices it's very brief it's it's just these four uh uh tracks and uh i i think you'll you'll really dig it it's for eight singers um she's one of them she was the youngest person to ever win the pulitzer prize at the time she was 29 years old and for that we will never forgive her um, but she seems like a very sweet and genuine and very smart person. Um, uh, and this is a very cool piece of music. Um, and then the app that I have for you is a music related app that I don't know if you have talked about on the show before. I did not mention in any of our discussion today, an app called Encoda. Are you familiar with this? No, maybe, well, maybe it, how, how do you spell it? lowercase n-k-o-d-a it is yeah definitely uh, not the app icon is a white white square with a red circle and a white kind of eighth note looking thing in the middle of it it is a sheet music subscription service so in a world as we are in now where everything is its own subscription service there is this very compelling subscription service for sheet music um they are uh in, in, and also in a world where everything is either the uber of whatever it is or the netflix of whatever it is this is Correct. a netflix of sheet music they have deals with uh most of the major publishers um there's only the one the big one they're missing is universal edition um but anything other than universal edition they probably have a deal with the publisher they have scores and parts um and it's its own score reader so you can open these scores up you can download them you can annotate them with an apple pencil it is cross-platform you can use it on ios mac windows android if you've got one of the Kindle Fire tablets, it runs on a bunch of different things. I don't think it runs in a web browser yet, so I don't think you can use it with Chromebooks. But the whole point is that you pay one subscription price, which is ten bucks a year, um, or ten bucks a year. That's not that's not true. It's ten bucks a month, uh, and you get access to their entire score library, and they've got all kinds of stuff. They've got educational stuff they've got rock music they've got musicals they've got all kinds of classical rep they've got lots of different editions of some things so for people that are studying and want to compare different editions of like beethoven piano sonatas you can do that they've got those beautiful henley editions of the beethoven sonatas um they've got really recent stuff so i my my graduate theory seminar that i mentioned earlier is focusing on contemporary music composition and so it's got uh some some stuff that would be really hard for us to track down even through interlibrary loan would just be really hard for us to track down these things so they can i, I can ask my students to look at a score of you know an opera that was just premiered you know two or three years ago We've got the whole score available to us in this service, um, and it's it's really really cool. So um, you can put your own collections together. You can share collections of scores. You can share annotations of scores, which is very cool. Um, there's there's a, it's got a lot going for it. Um, and the the biggest thing it has going for it is the library itself. I would say as a score reader, it's not quite as good as something like Four Score or Music, um, but uh, it more than makes up for the the lacking in some of the score reader features by the amazing library that it has. 
Um, so that is again Encoda, N K O D A. Um, and that is in whatever your favorite app store is. I have no idea how this isn't on my radar. Um, this is my afternoon now. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Get the get the free trial of it. I think the free trial is seven days or fourteen days or something, and you'll just like spend all afternoon looking through it. Like I and I use this for class all the time. Um, so again, like if I know that I need like. I don't know. Like if I want to look at a, a piano vocal version of like a Radiohead tune to show in my Theory 2 class, it's there. Um, so, you know, all kinds of stuff. Wild. Wow. Okay. Downloading now. Gosh, so You're this welcome. is hard for me because I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, um, I have to, I have to like cheat on my own show because like we're, I don't, li- I don't listen to as much, um, I don't listen to as, as many podcasts and as much music when I'm home. You know, I just, it, it's just something that, uh, I do. I listen to more music than I do podcasts when I'm at home, but, um, I, I cheated when I recorded two days ago and, uh, I, I said the new childish Gambino record, I'm going to premeditate as my album of the week. And it turns out uh-huh. I have listened to it multiple times since and actually can stand on that statement and say things <laughs> about its musical merits now. Nice. But, but instead of doing that, I'm going to cheat again and say that uh, one of my favorite independent pop singers, Becca Stevens, also released an album earlier this week that I have barely listened to. But uh, she is wonderful and is a really good uh, folk instrument player. She was uh, featured on one of Snarky Puppy's Family Dinner. Is it Family Dinner, the name of the record with all the collaborations? That sounds um, right, but I could just be... I feel like family dinner snapped yeah. kind of thing. She's I'll, I'll link her collaboration with them in the show notes. Um, she's a wonderful songwriter and uh, just like she's, she's just got a lot of great stuff going on and I'm really looking forward to digging into her new album. It's called wonder bloom. She's been actually performing selections from it on her Instagram account. Um, she's just been like stuck, I think in her, either her home or her brother's, home with his uh family and has just been like publishing lots of heartfelt song performances to her instagram channel and um i don't know it's just it's just very touching and considerate and she's the kind of person who is uh her musicianship shines when she's you know like when she's all the the band is taken away and it's all dressed down like that but then it also shines under um like higher production values with like really thoughtful arrangements. And um, she, she's great. She collaborates with Jacob Collier. He's kind of like, I think a lot of people in the music community, especially the theory community are kind of fan fanboy and over Jacob Collier these days. So um, I, she's I got... hear about it from my students all the time. Like I'm so like, I I'm so sick of hearing from my, my music theory students about Jacob Collier and Adam Neely. Oh, uh, Oh, Adam Neely. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I will say like, I like, they're cool. I, I like them. They're cool. I, I just, I'm, I'm done. We, we, we yeah, need a I'm sure. Sh- <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that, you know, I can imagine being a college student and having the time to just watch Adam Neely YouTube videos. And I have, and I, I actually, I do really quite like Adam Neely's YouTube videos. They're very entertaining. Um, especially his, he did a really good one recently of uh, analyzing the national anthem at the Super Bowl that I compared oh, it cool. to the Whitney Houston one. That was that was actually a really nice one. But no, I totally can imagine all of your music theory students just like wanting to do nothing but talk nonstop about those two people. So anyway, Jacob Collier, say say what you will about uh, his music, but he has uh, a couple of really nice collaborations with Becca Stevens also. No, um, I like my- his stuff. It's very cool. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, so Becca Stevens is great. Um, oh, gosh, an app of the week, too. So, um, like, when is there not something that I'm using? Um, I, I really, like, I feel like I'm I'm cheating here because this gets so much attention whenever I talk about software. But um, when for the three weeks I was at school between child leave and this whole mess that we're in. Um, I just, you know, I was, I, when I got back to work, I had to do uh, the planning for our band adjudication, which is like when all the middle school bands in the district perform on a stage in front of three judges. And 
Uh, I'm not like a real great logistic guy. So even though a lot of things I do with technology are about productivity, I, I always tell people like I'm strapping myself together with duct tape. That's what you're seeing me like hold myself together. I'm actually a mess. Uh, I need this technology. Um, so my trusted friend OmniFocus uh, recently became something that I've depended on a lot more for my work because um, I got back to work and I was totally like not adjusting very well to all the responsibilities. And I had a week to prepare for this giant field trip with lots of material responsibility and logistic responsibility and communication. And I have these little text-based project templates in OmniFocus that um, I actually, in an app called Drafts, I have these these text files that um, I trigger them and then I give it like a date, like a due date of an event. And then it asks for some other information like, what is the name of this project? And like, you know, what is the date you want to start working on it, the date that it's due? And then it automatically fills out a project in OmniFocus with due dates and deadlines that are uh, relative to the actual date of the performance. So it like ordering the pizza for the students to eat will be show up as due like three days before the actual event. Um, organizing the score packets for the judges will show up as like, I can start working on it the day before, but it's due at the latest at noon before we hop on the bus, stuff like that. Um, that just really holds me together. And I would literally forget every responsibility that I have if I did not premeditate these elaborate templates. I'm not an OmniFocus user, but I, I, I know a lot of OmniFocus users. I, I'm a to-do person myself, but uh, it's it seems like, you know, a thing that I can totally imagine running my whole life by. It's definitely a way of life. Like, it's it's of all the to-do apps, it is an app that, re that asks that you use it its way. Right. But then it's infinitely more flexible a tool for you once you use it the way that it wants to be used. I feel like I use to do pretty closely to the way OmniFocus wants to be used because I, I do something that is that is very um, David Allen GTD informed. Like my system is is kind of basically my version of GTD, uh, which I think is basically how how OmniFocus wants to be used. Uh, I'm just really happy with to do, and it's also part of SetApp, which I, I don't know if you've talked about SetApp before, but I, I I'm a big SetApp nerd. Well, and it's funny that you mentioned Ulysses um, earlier because I am recently, very recently, trying out Setup. It's a subscription to that gets you access to a bunch of really popular Mac apps for those who are unfamiliar. And um, I honestly like Setup makes a more logical. Like I, I don't, it's not really an app. I guess it's technically an app. I mean, it is definitely it lives in my applications folder. But that is far more an appropriate app of the week for me to share than OmniFocus in terms of uh, <laughs> something new. What you're actually that's using, more, yeah. What I'm actually using that's new to me. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because I'm actually going to make that my app of the week because, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> because it fits the criteria of this segment way better. That being said, I'm not cutting out the OmniFocus part. OmniFocus is a killer tool and it saves me every time but we no, can set up we could do another hour on all the the things that i that i use from set app that that i, I finally it's so good. yeah i i finally got to the point where enough of the apps in it like i'm like a new version has come out of them where i felt like it was finally worth it for me to like start subscribing for the new versions you know like i think i'm i'm behind on downy and ulysses i was not using more recently sure as was previously stated um, yeah, it's got a lot of really good Mac apps that are for productivity and to, I, to do, I have seen there. I just, you know, I don't, I don't use it, but I hear excellent things about it. How's, is the Mac app pretty good? That's the yeah. one that I've never used. Yeah. So the Mac app is good and it syncs with the iOS app over Dropbox and, uh, the subscription from to do, uh, in set app will kind of sync over to uh the ios app just like it does in ulysses which is really cool um it is less structured it is more up to you to create the structure so all that structure that, that this comes from the the very opinionated OmniFocus that you were just talking about earlier if you want to do something like that in to do you can but it it's up to you to set it up yeah the, and those tools also end up being flexible in their own way. I, the one that I really like, aside from OmniFocus, is called Things. 
And I think like to do, it's less demanding that you use it in a certain way. So if, if you are not about all those fiddly features, then you can actually get it doing a lot for you with very, very little setup. Totally. Totally. So yeah, there's a there's a bunch of really great things in in setup that I that I love a lot and use all the time. So yeah. Well, I I didn't I, like I I knew that there was a lot of crossover in our interests, particularly with apps, but I didn't realize quite how immense it was. We should do this again sometime. I I'm here for it, especially now that it seems like I'm just gonna be home at my desk behind a microphone for the next you know for the foreseeable future, as far as I can tell. Very very fun. All right, I'll, and I'm sure I'll be in touch on Twitter. Excellent. I'll see you All right, around. take care. Yeah. Bye. All right, bye.